Before you're seated, ma'am, let's get you sworn in. If you would raise your right hand and state your name. Tara Hulsa. Spell your last name for me. H E L S E L. Thank you. Thank you, Andy, for taking your seat. I'll ask that you keep your voice nice and amplified so we can all hear you. Allow the attorneys to finish their questions before you respond, and they will extend the same courtesy to you. Thank you, Thank you. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. By whom do you employ? RJ Lee Group. And what is RJ Lee Group? RJ Lee Group is a materials characterization laboratory. It is located in Memorial, Pennsylvania. Um, essentially, it has a variety of different departments that offers a wide range of services. Um, for example, there is a chemistry department that does things like water testing, a group that does concrete analysis. Um, however, I personally am a member of the criminal forensics department. You said the criminal forensics department? Yes. And um, what is your job in the criminal forensics department for RJ Lee Group? I'm a forensic scientist. And how long have you been doing that type of work? Um, since November of 2016. And now, what's your educational background then? I have a Bachelor of Science degree in Forensic Science from Wayne Group University. Okay. And can you describe any additional training um, that you've received after you graduated from college? Um, yes, I completed our RJ Leaders training program for gunshot review analysis. And what does that consist of? Um, basically, it involves um, shadowing a training analyst um, to learn the procedures, reading the standard operating procedures, relevant publications in the field. I also had to complete some 250 samples, of which my results would then get compared to um, the results of the training analyst. Um, I had to complete an exam on gunshot residue, an exam about the scanning electron microscope, which is the instrument that we use to do our analysis. And then following all of that, I also had to complete a competency exam. And, and you obviously completed all of those requirements? Yes, I did. And you continue to maintain uh, proper um, training and you kept up the date? Yes, our uh, proficiency tested once a year. Do you also uh, give lectures or present on the area of gunshot residue? Um, I have in the past, yes. And when did you do that? Um, in, I believe it was November of 2017, mm -hmm. I did a presentation at a conference about gunshot residue. Okay. Now, your training, you said, consisted of examining 250 different samples with regard to gunshot residue? Yes. And you had those peer-reviewed by somebody who's more experienced? Correct. And you passed all that training? Yes, I did. And after you passed those 250 cases, did you then get cases of your own? Yes. Approximately how many cases have you worked on in the area of gunshot residue analysis? I have done over 300 cases. Okay. And now, those cases, are they just for the state or the prosecution? Um, no, they're not. You do? Um, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Um, the cases are for agencies such as police department, sheriff's offices, um, prosecution, and then I also work for the defense as well. Okay. And you also indicated you undergo proficiency testing. Can you explain a little bit what that is? Yes. Um, so once a year, we receive an external proficiency test from a company called Forensic Testing Services. Basically, they send us gunshot as these samples that have known results. And then we have to analyze those samples and submit to them um, our findings. So one person in our department will be responsible for submitting it externally every year. But um, in addition to that, all of us will analyze those samples separately and then submit it internally so that once a year we are um, tested for, for proficiency. And you've been found proficient? Yes, I have been. Okay. Now, you said you tested over 300 samples of gunshot residue? Um, 300 cases, over 3,000 samples. 3,000 samples, 300 cases. And have you ever been called upon to testify as a witness in court? Yes, I have. You've ever been qualified as an expert witness in the area of gunshot residue analysis? Yes, I have. On how many occasions? Uh, 23 previous times. And in what courts? Um, I, um, different courts in the states of Pennsylvania, Maryland, Delaware, um, Florida, uh, Louisiana, Michigan, Kansas, the state of Washington, Hawaii, and also the country of Bermuda. Now, have you ever been tendered as an expert witness and failed to qualify? No, I have not. Judge, at this point in time, the state would uh, move to have Ms. Hustle qualified as an expert here at gunshot residue analysis. Mr. Ryan, I have no idea. 
All right, the court uh, will accept uh, Ms. Heisler as an expert in the area of gunshot residue analysis based on her education, experience, and training. She's a Thank you. So, so can you explain to the jury what gunshot residue is? Gunshot residue, in the broadest sense of the term, refers to all particles that result from the discharge of a firearm. Um, however, when I'm talking about gunshot residue, what I'm referring to are the particles that come from the primer. They originate from the primer, and where do they go once they originate from the primer? Sure. Um, so after the discharge, these particles are produced, and they will exit the firearm in the form of a cloud and those particles will lay on the area surrounding the discharge. Okay. And is this what occurs when the trigger of a firearm is pulled? Yes, it is. Can you take us through that step? So pull the trigger of a firearm, what happens? Um, so whenever a firearm is discharged and the trigger is pulled, um, this causes something inside the firearm called the firing pin to strike the primer cap, which is the bottom of the cartridge. Um, this will start a reaction that causes the primer to burn and the burning of the primer will cause the gun powder to burn. So because of this burning inside the firearm, there is a buildup of high heat, and as a result, high pressure inside the firearm, and that pressure is what ultimately will expel the bullet from the firearm. So um, because of, um, during this discharge as well, sorry, um, because of how hot it is inside the firearm, the different elements from the primer, um, which I should go back and add, um, the primer is composed of three compounds that together have the metals of lead, barium, and antimony. So during this reaction, because of how hot it is inside the firearm, those different elements from the primer are going to become a gas. And this gas is going to exit the firearm through any available openings in the form of this gaseous cloud called a plume. Um, however, because of how much cooler it is outside the firearm than it was inside the firearm, those elements are going to be cooled down and condense together and combine and form particles. And that's all the particles that I'm looking for when I do an analysis or them. Now, the particles you're looking for um, contain those three elements? Yes, they do. And you indicated they're lead, barium, and antimony? That is correct. And are there uh, particles that are called three-component particles and two-component particles? Yes. Can you explain for the jury what a three-component particle is? So the three component particles, um, which are also referred to as particles characteristic of gunshot residue, are particles that contain all three elements of lead, barium, and antimony together in a single particle. Um, like I said, they are called characteristic of gunshot residue uh, because these particles are highly specific to the discharge of a firearm. Uh, Let me stop you there. Highly specific to the discharge of a firearm. Can this type of a particle be found, oh, let me back up a minute, let's start. Lead is an element that's found in nature, correct? Yes. Barium? Yes. Antimony? Yes. Now, they're all found in nature, but you're able to say, uh, when you're looking for gunshot residue, that it's highly specific to the discharge of the firearm. How can you do that if they're all found in nature? Um, because for all three of them to be together in a single particle is what makes them rare. So all of those elements are common in the environment, and they're not found often together in single particles. Now, are there specific jobs or specific things that those three elements can be found in? Um, so, say somebody who works with a brake pad. Yes. Could it be possible for all three elements to be present if somebody who works with brake pads on a regular basis? Somebody who works with brake pads, you would expect to find the lead bearing an antimony, but also another element. Is that what you're saying? Um, yes, so lead bearing and antimony particles in rare occasions could come from brake pads, but yes, those particles are known to have iron as well. Okay. 
And in addition to the iron and the elements that are contained in that, if something is uh, highly specific to gunshot residue, is there a specific shape that would make it different? Yes. Um, gunshot residue particles are going to have a shape that is kind of molten. Um, because of the iron that is formed as a result of a high heat reaction, they're going to be smooth and round. Okay, that's different from something that's found with break Yes, red cup particles um, typically have a more regular morphology, um, different than that of gunshot residue. So you're able to distinguish it? Um, based on the combination of chemistry and morphology, yes. Okay, and that's what enables you to say that something's highly specific to a gunshot rather than anything else. Yes. 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 Is that what makes you able to tell the difference? Yes. Okay. Now, Somebody who works with or uses a lot of fireworks, is that something that could have those three particles, the lead, iron, and antimony? Um, it is possible. There is one particular type of firework known as the crack ring ball that has been known to produce um, three component particles. However, the particles from that particular firework also contain um, amounts of magnesium. And that's another one of those elements that when I'm doing an analysis, if I come across magnesium in my particles, I do not include those particles in my population. Now, three component particles, that's where all three elements are present? That is correct. And what's a two component particle? Two component particles are particles that contain two of the three elements. So there are lead antimony particles, iron antimony particles, and magnesium antimony particles. So these two component particles also do come from the discharge of a firearm. Um, however, there are um, more uh, alternate sources of these two component particles. So when two component particles are found by themselves, they're somewhat inconclusive. They could come from the discharge of a firearm. They could come from another source. I can't say for sure. However, when they're found in combination with those three component particles, they kind of act as support, reinforcing that what we're looking at is a fact population of gunshot residue. So in your capacity as a forensic scientist with R.J. Lee, did you receive a case uh, or a SAM kit from Burlington County Prosecutor's Office? Yes, it did. Was that in reference to the homicide of the Shaquille Williams? Yes, it was. Do you recall when you received that kit? Uh, we received it in April 2018. Okay. And what did that kit contain? It was a kit that contained four gunshot residue collection subs, um, labeled as coming from subjects Douglas Lewis. Okay. Now, the samples that came from Douglas Lewis, you indicated there were four samples? Yes, that's correct. Were they packaged separately? Um, so each sub is individually um, contained, but those subs were all together in one kit. Okay. Now, the fact that they're individually contained, what's the purpose of that? Um, so that they can't um, contaminate one another. So they're all in separate vials. For sake of sample integrity. Okay, now did you conduct an examination with regard to each of those four samples? Yes, I did. Can you take the jury through the process that you go through when you conduct your analysis? Um, yes. So, to do our analysis, we use an instrument called the scanning electron microscope, also referred to as the SEM for short. Um, so, the SEM is a highly powerful microscope that allows you to do a couple of things that is important for gunshot residue analysis. Um, it will allow you to view an image that can be magnified by thousands of times, which is essential for gunshot residue because um, gunshot residue is not visible to the naked eye. So this allows us to actually see those particles, um, which is important because in addition to chemistry, the morphology and the shape of particles is important when doing this examination. Um, in addition, this instrument also allows you to see the chemical makeup of those particles. So because we're looking for particles that have a specific chemistry, this instrument allows us to be able to look at the particles and see what they're doing. So um, the analysis that we do is a two-part analysis. The first part is an automated analysis, where the samples are put into the instrument, and I set up parameters basically saying, these are the samples that I've put the instrument, here are the uh, locations for where those samples are, and then from there, the instrument will do automated analysis, where it will scan the surface of the samples looking for potential gunshot residue-related particles. Once it runs through all of the samples and that's complete, I then go back and do a manual analysis, where I go back and look at those particles that that instrument will actually make potential gunshot residue particles. Uh, I can look at their shape, I can 
can look at their chemistry. Um, I can look at them for as long, as long as I want. In this process, um, during this part, I make uh, any adjustments to the classifications of the particles um, and basically determine the final calls for what these particles are. What do you mean to make the final call for the classifications? Um, so the instrument will characterize particles as being three component particles or different types of two component particles. Um, because the instrument is only scanning on these particles for about five seconds, sometimes this is off. Um, this instrument is not perfect. We have a two part analysis for a reason. So, whenever I'm doing my analysis, um, sometimes that classification can change. Um, this is because during um, the spectrum where it shows you what elements are present, um, there are different peaks that represent the elements, and there is some overlap of the peaks depending on those elements. Um, for example, Sulfur and lead um, have a similar peak, um, but sometimes the instruments can't clarify which is which. However, by looking at that, um, by looking at the spectrum um, for a longer period of time, um, I can ultimately see the second and third peak of lead that resolve out and can make that determination. So, for example, um, the instrument might say that a particle is a barium antimony particle, but also has sulfur. I might look at that particle and determine that sulfur is not actually lead. This is a three-component particle. Now, did you perform this analysis with regard to each of the four samples that were taken from Doug Lowe's? Yes, I did. And as a result of that, did you receive any positive reactions? Yes, I did. And with regard to the back of Doug Lowe's right hand, can you take the jury through what you're finding for as a result of that analysis? Yes, um, the back of the right hand contains one particle characteristic of our shock residue. Is that a three component particle? Yes, a three, one three component particle. So that one three component particle, did it contain each of those three elements? Yes, it did. Did it contain iron? It did not. Did it contain magnesium? It did not. So based on your findings, uh, were you able to conclude what produced that residue? Yes, I would consider that to be a shock residue particle. Do you hold that to a reasonable degree of scientific certainty? Yes, I do. Did you also have an opportunity to examine that sample, um, as you said, under the regular microscope manual? Um, yes, I manually examined the okay. particles. And when you manually examined that particle, were you able to uh, observe its morphology? Yes, I was. And was that also consistent with the presence of gunshot residue? Yes, it was. Did you also receive a positive reaction or a positive result regarding the left palm of Doug Lowe's? Yes, I did. And what did you find on the left palm of Mr. Lowe's? Um, the left palm contained one particle characteristic of our shot residue, which again is one three-component particle, and it also contained two two-component particles. And what conclusions were you able to draw as a result of that? Uh, that this was a population of our shot residue on the left palm. And again, you conducted the manual examination as well? Yes, I did. And what did you determine with regard to the morphology when you looked at the manual microscope? The morphologies were consistent with our shot residue. Presence of any iron? No. Is there a presence of any magnesium? No. Anything else, in your opinion, that could have caused this other than gunshot residue? No. Is there any significance to the fact that you found those two two-component particles in conjunction with that three-component particle on his left hand? Um, sorry, did you repeat that question? Was there any significance to the fact that you found the two two-component particles in conjunction with the three-component particle on the left hand? Uh, so in this case, since they were found in combination with the three-component particle, um, like I was mentioning earlier, in that case, they're actually kind of a support. Um, adding to the fact that this is a population of gunshot residue. So there are three, uh, three components of particles and two components of particles. And do you hold those conclusions for a reasonable period of time? Yes, I do. No further questions. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Wright. Thank you. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. I have a question. You indicated in your background that you've done some training, lecturing on this topic? Um, I did one presentation on this topic. Okay. And have you had occasion to instruct other uh, young friends of scientists that are, that are in this work, uh, spend time and talk to them and train them? Um, I have trained one of our analysts, yes. Let me ask you this. Um, what, what do you teach, assuming you, you teach those that collect this material? Do you ever talk to them about how to protect the 
integrity of those samples? Um, so I haven't really specifically spoken to collection, um, but there are ways that there can be um, integrity in any of the samples. Yeah, because for instance, in, in this case, apparently Mr. Lewis hands were swabbed with the, with the test kit in the police station. Were you told that? I was not. Um, do you know if there's any literature that suggests that a person riding in a police car on the way to the police station could very well pick up um, the elements of gunshot residue in the, co in the confines of that police car? Um, I believe there have been studies on this topic. Um, really, the possibility of there being contamination from a police car is going to be dependent on a lot of factors. Um, how often that police car gets cleaned, um, but in theory, if there is gas hot residue in a police car, it can certainly get transferred onto other surfaces. And if that's the case, if that person, once, once taken from the police car, is tested with SCN kit, it'll show up, gunshot residue will show up as if he had fired a weapon, right? Um, so, whenever we find a positive result and it sees this in our report, um, the interpretations that can be made are that um, an individual either discharged a firearm, was in the proximity of a firearm being discharged, or got the particles on them through transfer, um, all of which being equally probable. Equally probable. Correct. So, in other words, the, the transfer was could conceivably take place in the back of the patrol cars going to the police station. If there is a shot in the back of the police car, it could be transferred, yes. And there are, there are studies in, in some literature that suggest that that is a potential and it should be guarded against. Um, yes. Now, let's take one step further. Inside a police station or an interrogation room or somewhere in a police station, so not, not the car, but in the police station, the issue of transference exists there too, doesn't it? Sure. And if someone who has nothing on their hands uh, came in contact with gunshot residue um, in the police station, it would show as if they had fired up. It would show a positive for gunshot residue, which could mean any three of the scenarios. Once again, all equally probable. Now, are there any types of techniques available to uh, the individuals that are collecting these items? Um, the whole police activity in terms of arresting somebody and bringing them to the station. Is there anything that is recommended uh, procedurally uh, to do to protect the person's hands, for instance? Say a person is arrested on the street. Is there any way that their hands can be protected from the transference of uh, gunshot residue from either the car or somehow picking it up in the police station? Sure. Um, some agencies will bag the hands of the individual um, to guard them from any contamination. When you say bag, what do you mean? Um, so, in my experience, in cases where I've seen it, they will literally put paper bags around the hands, I believe, and take them around so that they can't come into contact with anything. But these are people that are alive, though, right? Yes. And that's not my dead people. There. Correct. Now, <clears throat> The prosecutor asked you if, if you hold your opinion beyond a reasonable degree of scientific certainty that the testing that you did and the particles, the outcome of your testing, is consistent with gunshot residue, and you said yes. Yes. Okay. But your opinion is not necessarily that the donor of this material, Mr. Lewis, in our case, actually shot the gun. You're not saying that, are you? Correct. Um, I'm just saying that the samples are positive for gunshot residue. Right. And we've talked about transference. Correct. And we've talked about these elements can appear in the environment. Yes. Um, so I, I guess what we, what we have is that um, we have a scientific report that says that as a result of the test, there is the presence of and use the technical term of gunshot residue on those samples. That is correct. And that essentially is all you can testify to. Yes. The, the samples are positive for gunshot residue. It could have gotten there from discharging a firearm in, in proximity to a firearm discharge or through transfer. Or through transfer. Correct. 
and the failure to properly bag the hands could ensure that, particularly if you're being taken someplace in a police vehicle to a police station, the possibility of transference becomes more heightened than it doesn't. Um, depending on the cleaning policies of that agency, I'm not familiar with how often the police car gets um, cleaned, how often the um, police station gets cleaned. It's going to depend on a lot of factors. Right. But we can ensure that there wouldn't be contamination on an individual's hands if the individual's hands were bagged by the paper bag that described for us before they got into the patrol car. Correct, that would be a precaution that would um, assist in that manner. And if you're looking to get have high integrity to this this whole process, it would make sense, tell me if I'm wrong, to take that one little extra step of taking two little paper bags and take them to somebody's wrist to ensure that all the highly technical scientific work that you do has some meaning, a valid meaning in a trial, right? Um, it would be helpful, yes. It would. Okay. Um, thank you. Thank you. Hey. Uh, this is you indicated there are three ways that gunshot residue can come on somebody's hands, correct? That is correct. And one was if they're in proximity to somebody who actually fires a gun. That's correct. And why is that? Um, because, like I said, whenever gunshot residue exits the firearm, it exists in the form of this cloud. And this cloud will kind of dissipate outward within about four to six feet. So if you're someone that's standing near someone that discharges a firearm, you will likely be exposed to that cloud of particulate and get it on yourself as well. So in order, if I'm in proximity, I have to be within four to six feet. Give or take, yes. So if a gun was fired over by that door, the chances are pretty good that a gunshot residue is not getting on my hands over here. Jack, I have to object to the leading nature of these questions. I don't know. Okay. Now, the other way it could get on there is how? Uh, through discharging a firearm. So if I, if I shoot a firearm? Yes. Okay. And the third way is transference, you could be, correct? That's correct. Right. Now, do those elements stay lingering in the air for an indefinite period of time? No, they will eventually fall to the ground. Okay. And how do they get there in the first place? Uh, I'm sorry? How do those particles that are consistent with uh, gunshot residue, how do they get there in the first place? Uh, through the discharge of a firearm. Okay. So if a gun was discharged in the back of a firearm or a back of a police car, is that how that would get, get in there? Um, that could be one way. But where are some of the other ones? Um, if someone with gunshot residue on their hands goes into the back of the police car, they can transfer particles from themselves on into the police car. Okay. Um, so if somebody had them on their hands and they got into the police car, they could transfer them to the police car? That's correct. Um, now, if I fail to bag somebody's hands, like Mr. Riley suggested, is that going to result in the addition of gunshot residue in my hands or the dissipation of gunshot residue from my hands? Could you repeat the question? Sure. I have a suspect who I don't bag their hands. Okay. Would I expect to find more gunshot residue on there or less gunshot residue on a person who doesn't have their hands bagged? Um, so if an individual has gunshot residue on their hands, they will begin with, and then their hands aren't bagged. In theory, their hands could then come into contact with other things, which I would expect to remove particulate. So, if they touch something that has gunshot residue on it, or if they in fact fired a gun and they already had it on it, correct? Yes. Do you often get samples from suspects whose hands are not bad? Yes. That's not uncommon? It's not uncommon. That's all I have to say. Yes. I don't want to prolong this, but you get samples from people whose hands have been back. That is correct as well. But if it comes up positive from gunshot residue and their hands are back, it's less likely that the presence of gunshot residue on their hands has come from the transference from other sources. I still can't say that because there could have been a transfer of particles before the bagging of the hands. Okay. Now, you would agree with me that um, police officers go out on the range and they shoot on a regular basis, right? 
I believe so, yes. They shoot rifles, they shoot pistols, they sometimes shotguns, machine guns, stuff like that, right? Yes. Okay. And after they're finished at the range, um, they get in their police cars and they go back to the station, right? Yes. And you would agree with me that gunshot residue adheres itself not just simply to the hands, but the clothes. You can, yes. And if the person has gunshot residue on the clothes or in the environment they're operating in, that environment could very well cause the transference issues that show as a false positive to someone who really didn't fire a gun. You follow me? Yes, that is possible. That's possible. And then when they get to the station and they sit down at their desk and they write out reports or do whatever they do in the station, obviously these particles, particularly if you're out of the rain for a period of time, you're shooting a lot. That should tend to suggest that this cloud that we talked about, you have to be 3 to 5 feet away from them or something like that, could be adhering to a person's, an officer's uniform and clothing and you wouldn't really realize it, would you? Correct. Because it doesn't give off the smell or anything. And in a police station, as in a police car, the issue of transference um, is very real, isn't it? Um, again, it's possible. Um, it would depend, again, yeah, if the police cars are cleaning the regulations, um, it would be less of an issue. It's going to depend on the factory question. You don't know anything about the arrest and trans transfer of Mr. Lewis back to the police station because you weren't given that information. So you don't know how clean it was or not clean it was. Correct. You don't know where he was in the police station or how long he was in the car. Correct. Now, the prosecutor points out there's three different ways that gunshot residue can show up on someone. And obviously, they, being in the presence of a weapon is fired, right? Correct. Firing the weapon yourself. Correct. Okay, what was the third one again? Transfer. I'm sorry? Transfer. Thank you. Thank you, Judge. No further questions. Mm -hmm. You had it on both hands, correct? Yes. Is it unusual to use two hands when you're standing up or you're sitting down or you have to use one hand or you're going to use both hands? I'm sorry? Most people, they don't just use one hand, they use 